local police fire and rescue scrutiny panel. Thank you all very much for coming along. And apologies for last week, but I think it was very necessary with the, uh, the passing of Her Majesty. Do we have any apologies, substitutions, or declarations of interest? We have apologies from Councillor McGuire with Councillor Jackson substituting. Can be only moved to a roll call. The following members, please indicate if you are present at the meeting, either in person or remotely. Councillor Brennan. Present remotely. Councillor Clockerty. Present in the chamber. Councillor Crowther. Present remotely. Councillor Daisley. Present remotely. Councillor Jackson. In the chamber. Councillor Law. Present remotely. Provost McKenzie. In the chamber. Councillor Moran. Present in the chamber. chamber. Councillor Quinn. Present in the chamber. Councillor Reynolds. Councillor Reynolds. Oh. Councillor Wilson. In person, thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Are there any declarations of interest? No. Um, from the police, I see we've got uh, Chief Inspector Cameron. Good morning to you. Morning. Um, do we have Pat Callahan? Yep, Pat Callahan, I'm here. Um, I'd also like to give the apologies of Chief Superintendent uh, Laura Waddle, uh, our new divisional commander. Um, she's not in the office today. Ah, will you be coming regularly, Pat? No, in all, in all likelihood, it will be Chief Superintendent Laura Waddle um, that, that will attend future meetings, but if she's not available, then I will deputise for her. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Welcome. Um, Thank you. From fire, is Murdo Henderson there? Good morning. Morning, Murdo. I understand you're retiring after this meeting today. Is that correct? I am. Well, not quite. It's uh, Wednesday morning next week is my last day. Right. Well, I, I wish you well in your retirement. And who is with you? Uh, Station Commander Colin McGee, who okay. takes care of the Inverclyde stations. And we have apologies from Area Commander David McCarry, who's on annual leave this week. Welcome, Colin. I'd like to congratulate you on the uh, perfect protocol with a flag outside the fire station this time, following on from uh, uh, Prince Philip's funeral. It really was good to see you. Thank you very much. Did you get a younger member to shim up the flag for me? Uh, no comment. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I caught your buff. <laughs> I'd like to move on to agenda item number two, uh, the Police Scotland performance support. Mr Cameron? Yeah, OK. Um, so there's quite a lot to get through, so I'll, I'll try and get through it as quick as I can, and I'll give some examples of what we're also doing about some of the issues that I'll talk about this morning. So the period of this report is the 1st of April uh, until the 30th of June, and uh, the... the the figures that I'll give will be based against the five-year average, so it gives you an idea of where we are in terms of uh, historical aspect of it as well. So, so total crime, total crime across <laughs> Inverclyde is down two percent. Uh, so we have recorded uh, for that that period that I've just said uh, 1,615 crimes. Now that's down 33 crimes on the five-year average. Um, anything it says down is good to me. So uh, it could be better, but it's, it's gone in the right uh, direction. Uh, total number of incidents uh, recorded. So that the first bit is just about the number of crime reports that we've taken, but the total number of incidents that have been re recorded and attended are down 17.5%. Uh, we have had 4,654 incidents reported to us. And, uh, and to give that context, that's down 988 incidents on the same time five years ago. In terms of the, the actual the rest of the report, so I'll just try and break it down as best I can. It might not flow uh, in the way in which the report is written, but I'm trying to make it so it's easy to get, get through this. Uh, so violence and antisocial behaviour. So overall, violent crime, unfortunately, is up 6.4% to 215 violent crimes that have been recorded in Inverclyde. Uh, most of those are due to an increase in assaults which I'll come up to and I'll touch in a wee second. Uh, serious assaults are down 23.8%. We've had two attempt murders uh, in this period, 
both of which are detected and four individuals have been arrested for that. Uh, robberies are up 71.4%. There's a number of ongoing inquiries uh, mm. run about robberies mm. uh, and the detection rate for that will definitely change in the right direction. Mm. Uh, I said uh, earlier, assaults are up 7.9%. Uh, uh, that works out at 185 assaults, uh, of which 30 assaults were committed on emergency service workers, uh, mostly police. Uh, what I am pleased to say uh, is that that is an on, on a downward trend uh, of a reduction of 30.4% uh, assaults on emergency workers. So again, that's going in the right direction. Uh, Wolf of fire raising. So we've had 28 Wolf of fire raising uh, incidents recorded by ourselves. That, that, that's up 115.4%. So I know you keep hearing me say every time I come to this meeting that Wolf of fire raising is one of my big concerns. It remains a, a big concern for me. So uh, and in terms of that, our, our detection rate uh, is doubled. Well, it's actually more than doubled. Uh, it, uh, it was 12.3%, which is very low. However, wolf of fire raising is very difficult to prove, uh, and we're currently sitting at twenty five percent. So we've more than doubled our detection rate, and, and I'll keep working away at that to get it even better. Uh, we've had some issues run about uh, various areas uh, that we've set up various partnerships to try and address, um, and we'll continue to do that to try and drive down wolf of fire raising across Inverclyde. Uh, vandalism. So vandalism has fallen from an average of. 157 crimes to 130, so that's a 17.1% reduction in vandalism. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, disorder, disorder cops are down 31.8%. That figure is based on the previous year to date data because I don't actually have the full five year data, so I'll not give you anything of have based that against what we were like this, this time last year. So that works out 663 complaints of disorder uh, that have been reported. Um, to take that further, I now have a weekly call with the Head of Education every Monday morning to talk about youth disorder calls we've had over the weekend and that allows the schools then to try and uh, see if they can do something to prevent it for the following weekend by speaking to certain individuals. So that's working in well and we've also had the launch of our Pitching In 10 Week Diversionary Programme which we launched at Notre Dame High School um, and that's just recently been completed. Um, and that's about uh, signposting young people away from this disorder, disorder. So we're going to roll that out to other schools across uh, the region uh, in the coming months. Uh, cybercrime. So we still have a problem with cybercrime. Uh, we've recorded 76 cybercrime incidents in this reporting period, mostly for financial crime, sexual related crimes, or threatening communications, um, uh, and, and, and a whole variety of online scams. Um, I am keeping the public up to date with the current scams as they are across not just Scotland but the UK so that uh, everybody is educated to what to look out for and we'll just keep doing that. Um, acquisitive crime, so uh, overall dishonesty offences have increased by 7.7% to 345 uh, dishonesty offences. Yes. The vast majority of those are shoplifting, so 134 crimes have been recorded in that period which is up 33.5%. Um, and we are, as you know, we're doing some work about that. We're looking to introduce the exclusion zones to Inverclyde. That's currently at its final stage uh, of uh, consideration by the, the local procurator fiscals and the sheriffs. <clears throat> and I'm pretty optimistic that we'll get the go ahead for that and that will allow, allow us to deal with particularly <laughs> shoplifters uh, a, a better way. Uh, and we're also looking to introduce radio link uh, across a number of retail premises to allow us to communicate better uh, to try and prevent this shoplifting uh, continuing. Uh, house breakings, so I'm pleased to say house breakings are down 30.1%, so from 46 crimes to 32, so 14 less houses have been broken into. Um, and, and again, we'll keep working away at that uh, in terms of our detection rate. That's increased by 5.9% to 31.3%. Uh, still room for improvement there, but it's going in the right direction, which I'll, I will make sure we continue with that. Uh, motor vehicle thefts, so uh, that's down 45.1%. So there's been 19 uh, motor vehicle thefts recorded in Inverclyde in this period. Um, 
the in terms of serious organised crime and drugs, so we've had uh, 16 drug supply detections uh, compared to a 14.8 over a five year average. So that's going in the right direction. What I will say is um, that's the reporting period that I've got to give you. Uh, since then, I've significantly increased that, I almost doubled that actually. Uh, so that that will continue uh, to, to to go on an upward trend, I think. Organised crime members, uh, so we continue to target active organised crime group operating in Inverclyde using intelligence-led policing tactics. Uh, these are these are, have evolved as getting drug ser uh, drug sheriff search warrants uh, for twenty addresses in this reporting period, um, and as a result of that, a number of people have been arrested, charged, drugs have been seized, money, cars, jewellery, uh, Rolex watches. We've got two of them, um, and uh, a large amount of money. It has been seized um, as a result of that. And Rolex watches are exceptionally expensive, but we've got two of them uh, recovered. Um, and then just on the drug side of things, uh, so we recently uh, rolled out the naloxone programme. Uh, so all our community police officers in Inverclyde have now been trained and issued. Um, and I'm just about to start doing it with uh, response police officers and then CID officers, and eventually everybody who will be an operational officer in Inverclyde will be carrying a, a naloxone kit, and I know Inverclyde are really keen to support that, so uh, I made sure that we were one of the first uh, to get it once the Chief Constable had approved it to be rolled out across Scotland, so I'm delighted with that. Um, and uh, sexual crimes, so sexual crimes uh, have increased by 1.7%, uh, sorry, sorry, decreased, sorry, decreased by 1.7%. I have had a look at the figures today, and it's actually it's much better than that again, so that's good. The detection rate uh, for sexual crimes have increased from 38.2% to 50%. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, that is, that's really good. It's, it's obviously got room for improvement, but the amount of work that goes into these inquiries is quite significant. So to see that on the upper trend in terms of detection rate is, is really, really good to see. 90% of all sexual crimes have occurred in dwelling houses or, uh, or private settings. 30% uh, were against young people under the age of 16. And 43% 40, of all crimes in Inverclyde have involved non-recent reporting. Now, to give you some idea of that, um, non-recent reporting can go back years or decades. Um, so uh, these are quite protected inquiries, but we will take them on uh, and we've been quite successful with them recently. Uh, we have also worked with the schools on about uh, online safety with the young people, about sex extortion, grooming, rental fraud, money mules, ticket fraud, fake job scams, essay purchasing online. I didn't know such a thing, but apparently it's quite a big thing at the moment. Um, and grooming. So we're, <clears throat> we're doing that with the schools, uh, we've got leaflets and stuff like that. We will continue to do that through all the schools. Um, and we're also linked in with uh, Morton Youth Academy. Uh, over the next couple of weeks to talk about the dangers of social media as well. So there's a lot of work uh, getting done around about sexual crime and online grooming. Um, I'm, nearly, I'm nearly finished. Um, so missing people, uh, missing people, unfortunately, is up 291.9%. Uh, that is 291%. Uh, that, that equates to 55 missing people reported in Inverclyde um, compared to 14 the same time last year. 39% uh, of all reported pe persons in Inverclyde uh, were for individuals who we would say are in the top five who continually go missing. So it's to try and put that into context, whilst it's a significant rise in, in missing person inquiries, uh, almost half of those inquiries are for the same people who continually go missing. 61.8% uh, uh, of all missing persons are aged 19 or under, and 78% of all missing person inquiries are traced within 24 hours. And I will say, when you get a missing person inquiry and you know nothing about someone, uh, and within an hour you know everything about them, it's quite phenomenal police work that goes on with a missing person inquiry. Um, domestic abuse. So domestic abuse is up 0.5%. So we've had 227 uh, domestic abuse incidents uh, in the reporting period. 43.2% of all these incidents have, have resulted in a, a crime being recorded. Um, and just obviously the remainder has been no, no crime being recorded. And the detection rate is in, has increased 
from 65.7% to 77.5%, um, and we're bucking the national trend with that. I'll continue to make sure that, that happens uh, and we bring the right people to justice. Uh, road traffic, so we have uh, road traffic casualties are down 28.6%. Uh, There's been no persons killed on Inverclyde roads during this period. Two persons have been slightly injured. Uh, that's down from five this time last year. And a slight increase in the uh, number of persons slightly injured up from two to three. No children have been seriously injured. And offences relating to motor vehicles have fallen by 27.6%. As I always say at these meetings, my concern continues to be in Inverclyde. Individuals who uh, are still willing to go and drink and drug, particularly drug driving, and Inverclyde continues to rise. And again, that's up uh, uh, a full of 17%. Uh, we've done some work on about that to, to make sure uh, to keep the roads safe. So we've we put in the parking buddies on about the schools. I don't know if you've seen them or not, uh, but they're they're excellent actually. I really like that. Um, and that was joint funding with the council. It's a wee, it's a wee person, um, it's about as me actually. But uh, uh, and we use them to remind parents about where not to park. So that's been doing really well actually. Uh, Operation Close Pass. I was asked about that. I, had, I think it was two, <coughs> uh, scrutiny boards ago. So uh, we have an Operation Close Pass actually happening <coughs> right now. In Inverclyde, um, uh, so and that's about making sure cyclists are given enough room by motorists when they pass by them. So again, next scrutiny board, I'll let you know uh, the outcome of that. And speeding, speeding complaints. So we continue to get speeding complaints, and I continue to deploy officers with hand speed guns across the, the area uh, with, with a number of positive results out of that. Uh, a last wee bit here. Uh, complaints. So complaints are down uh, thirty one point four percent. So that's down this time last year from 35 complaints against the police to 24. So that's good. That's on the, the right direction. And, and I suppose a big bit for me as well is the quality of service complaints are down 36.4%. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. I know I covered lots there and there'll be lots of questions. Um, I'm sorry if I rushed that, but there was quite a bit to get through. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chief Inspector. That, that's a, a very good report. I'm going to go on to the chat for questions just in a second. I would like to ask you one question myself. I noticed house vacant down 33% and vehicle theft down 45%. Apart from the obvious professionalism of your staff, can you think of any reason uh, why there should be such significant drops in both these offences? Yeah, so I actively deploy officers into known hotspot areas where we've, we've, we've been given intel that maybe somebody's active in the area thinking about the house breaking or breaking into cars. So I actively deploy uniformed officers and plain clothes officers. Uh, so when you're lying in your bed sleeping at night, uh, I can assure you there's police officers in plain clothes or uniform walking about the areas where we think the house breakings are going to take place. So... Yeah, it is good old-fashioned traditional policing, um, putting the officers in the right place at the right time, and it's worked. There's still, still room for improvement because there's still house breakings, but we're getting it. And, and I suppose the other bit I will say is some of the some of the people who are breaking into the houses, they're in the jail because uh, we've caught them. Um, so, yeah, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Now, by the way, everybody, that, that question wasn't agreed between me and the Chief Inspector. Okay. Um, the next answer. Uh, Councillor Daisley, please. Thank you, Mayor Convener. Uh, thanks, Paul, for that update and that brief. It was really, really <coughs> uh, detailed and really thorough. Thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you. Thank you and well done for you and your team who have uh, taken up the challenge of carrying the naloxone kits and leading the way on that. I think it's so vital for people positions of staff within the community to to be leading uh, the way on things like this um, and, and shining a light on, on issues that are quite clearly big um, in Inverclyde, so thank you for that. Um, I've got a, first of all, I've got a comment around the youth gatherings. Now, this is what I'm going to um, I just wanted to uh, to bring up the fact that there was that there has been historically issues with youth gathering on Inverkip Beach, which I think everyone's aware of. 
Uh, but that this year spilled over into Beams Bay. I think the the, the young uh, people discovered that there was a beach there as well, and yeah. and it might have been a wee bit more uh, exciting. <laughs> Councillor Daisley, you're breaking up a bit. Um, I don't know, Chief of State, so can you hear? Yes, thank you. No. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Right, sorry about that. I think, uh, I think we'll move on. To Councillor Daisley, you've been breaking up and you went. Yeah. Um, I just is it, we'll leave is it is that any better now, is it? We'll come back to you later. Is that okay? You okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Um Councillor Brennan. Thanks very much, convener. Hopefully better luck um here. I'm not sure if the polls <laughs> still on, but um yeah, I think like Paul said, the thing that stands out for me from this report is the really significant increase in missing persons. So obviously that's that's a real issue of concern for Inverclyde that, you know, for the young people and their families, the people who look after them, that once they are missing, um, they're in potentially in really significant danger. So I just wanted to ask kind of three parts to my question that do we have an understanding of the reasons behind the increase? And what steps are we taking towards prevention to try and get those numbers back down? And also just to check in about the support that's given following the incidents, given that there are repetitions involved. I know there'll be crossover with our own council services there, but what sort of police checks are done? So understand the reasons for increase. What are we doing to ensure the support is given? Thanks very much. Chief Inspector, would you like to take that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so the increase in so so just under half of all the missing people uh, are for five individuals uh, in Inverclyde. So that that massive spike that you see, two hundred and ninety one percent or whatever it was, is, is 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 predominantly because of five individuals who are continually going missing uh, in Inverclyde. Um, now we're linking in with parents and other other people, other guardians to make sure that these individuals are getting the support that they need. Um, however, when a young person decides that they're going to leave or jump out the window or, or whatever to, to go on a night out, but there's not really much we can do about that. Um, we, we do have the not at home uh, con uh, approach with the various uh, youth homes across the, the division where just because somebody doesn't uh, turn up at a certain time doesn't mean they're a missing person. So there's a wee bit of education going around about that as well. Um, not just because somebody doesn't turn up at 10 o'clock when they said they'd be turning up at 10 o'clock doesn't mean they're always a missing person. And in terms of the support, so every time, every time a missing person goes missing, uh, we will always carry out a return interview with them to make sure that they've not been a victim of crime, they've not been exploited, uh, and if there's any lessons that we can learn from that. Um, we have a whole host of techniques and tactics in which we can trace missing people. Clearly, you wouldn't expect me say this over a, a live YouTube YouTube uh, uh, screening, but um, we're actually really, really good at finding missing people. But in terms of those individuals, there is work ongoing, case work ongoing to see what we can do about helping the individuals because they are continually going missing. Okay, Francesca? Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Law. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, my question's around, I've had reports from concerned parents that alcohol is being delivered from like mobile phone apps to underage um, youths without any ID checks. Um, I just wanted to know, are the police aware of this happening? And if so, what work's being done to stop this going forward? Yeah, so the last day, I might not have been the last day to uh, speak about the one before that, I'd highlighted that Dialaboos um, was operational in Inverclyde. So I, I, have a, I, have an, I have my own team here called the Alcohol and Violence Reduction Unit. Uh, they are currently looking at that. Um, I did put it out uh, last, that scrutiny board, basically to send a message out to anyone who's operating a Dialaboos in Inverclyde. How can I say it without saying, that, yeah, they're getting a warning. 
Right, but, but if you're going to if you're going to operate without a license to trade alcohol and and not check ID check because they they're not, they're not bothered, they just want the money. Um, then we're going to come for them and we'll we'll arrest them. We'll seize their stuff and and we'll just keep doing that till we stop that happening. Dialer boots is not specific to Inverclyde. It's across Scotland. Um, you know, you only need to go on your phone and type in dialer boots and you'll see. Um, and most of these are uh, unscrupulous individuals who don't have a license, who are not authorised to deliver or sell alcohol in the first place. Um, and it might not just be alcohol that they're selling. And they'll deliver it anywhere. So, yeah, I've got plans <clears> about that. It just takes a bit of time because I need the authorisation for various things. But, it, but, but, but I, it's on my radar. Um, just for uh, your information, the app that I was referring to that's been uh, discussed with me was the Snappy Shopper app, which I think is like a just eat for convenience stores. Yeah, I'm aware, I'm aware of that app. And we'll Can you know, apologies for interrupting, but I think you have to be careful about talking about specific apps. I think it probably would be preferable just to talk in general terms about the issue. Thank you, Miss Sinclair. Yeah, I would just I would just say that I, I'm aware of that app. Uh, whether or not that's dial booze, I can't say, but there's a whole host of other apps uh, that we are aware of. Okay, Kirsten. Yep, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, Pat Callahan wanted to come in. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. It was just in relation to the the previous question around missing people, and it was just to highlight that some of the trends that we're experiencing in Inverclyde that are experienced across the country. Um, Paul's referenced the significant rise in missing people um, that relates to primarily five individuals. Um, what we have to remember in terms of context is that when we're comparing this year's figures to last year's figures, the world has changed very much. You know, we've come out of the pandemic, come out of, come out of COVID. Um, so premises, locations that were previously out of bounds to young people and weren't available to them um, are suddenly more attractive this year than they've been in the past because they're now available. So that in itself has been a causal factor um, in terms of that increase. And just to give um, assurance to everyone on screen and everyone online, um, Paul's referenced these five individuals. Um, there is no complacency um, from Paul or his team relative to any of these individuals when they go missing. And the full assessment and all the same work goes in as if they were missing on the, on the first occasion. Every time um, there is a missing person, there is a degree and element of vulnerability. And we will risk assess um, that element of vulnerability and then ensure that we deploy not just the resources from our own local area in Inverclyde, um, but with other assistance that we secure from elsewhere within the force and other specialists that um, we can call on to assist us in terms of tracking down these individuals and in particular when it's vulnerable young people. Thanks very much for that. I'm going to take Councillor Jackson and then go back to Councillor Dyson. Hey, thank you, David. It's just on the domestic abuse figures. I, I know we're, we're aware that, you know, when it comes to football matches, that there's always a rise in domestic abuse, violent domestic abuse, and the police uh, uh, make a point of visiting people who may be vulnerable who they are aware of. Um, but my point is really on uh, coercion and control of behaviour. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the officer uh, about the detect detection rates, the conviction rates, because we know uh, coercive in, in uh, control of behaviour is far uh, harder to detect uh, in the reports on the uh, as for comments. So my question is on that. It's on detection rates and convictions of reports of coercive. Uh, Thank you. Chief Inspector, would you like to take that? Uh, so I can answer part of that. Um, so in terms of uh, coercion and control and behaviour, so uh, we're, we're really fortunate in Scotland and that we've got some really good legislation that helps us to deal with that. So uh, there's a thing called, we call it the DASA, the best of abuse call in that. So Section 1 DASA offences that allows us um, to look at an individual. So you might, you might have one person saying, you know, a particular... Uh, act that somebody's carried out, uh, we will then go and look at, and, and, and in law that won't be enough because you need corroborative evidence. So we'll go and look at other previous ex-partners and see if we can piece it all together. And that's called what we call it a Murov doctrine, um, taking character circumstance, similar relationships, and then we put the 
the big picture together. So we, we do that, we, we do all of that. So coercion and control behaviour actually is an offence. It's an offence in Scotland to, to if we can evidence that uh, and, and we'll go all out. Um, and again, as I say, you can use, you, you, if you don't have enough evidence at that incident, you can use uh, evidence from other incidents that that, uh, that perpetrator has been involved in. And we actively do that every day. I review every single domestic incident as part of my morning regime where I'll go over every domestic, I'll look at opportunities to see um, whilst there might be insufficiency when the officers have attended, I will always look at it from a DASA perspective, Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, um, and see if there's other opportunities in which we can libel a, a Section 1 offence against them or a coercive and controlling behaviour. Um, that, it's not only me that does that, so I, I'll do that from an Inverclyde perspective and I'll look at it to see that, that we've covered all the angles with that. But we also have a domestic abuse uh, chief inspector, uh, who a PPU, uh, Public Protection Unit uh, chief inspector, who's, who is responsible for a domestic abuse investigation unit. Again, they will also look at those domestic abuse incidents and see if there's any opportunities in there in controlling and, and uh, uh, coercion. Is, is part of that review that they do every morning, and then they and, and if they might task out if I don't have if I haven't already tasked out, and I'll give you a third a third thing that we do with domestic activities. So it's just to give you the importance of this. Uh, once I've reviewed it, once the DCI has reviewed it from the public protection unit, then somebody like uh, Superintendent or Callahan or the divisional commander will also review it at the morning meetings at nine o'clock. So it's getting a triple review to see have we made sure that this victim has uh, safeguarded them. In terms of convictions at court, I wouldn't have that information. You'd have to get that from the Procurator Fiscal Service. It's not something that uh, we actively monitor. That's for the Fiscal Service uh, to give out their performance on and stuff. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. Councillor Jackson. Yeah, thanks, Carmen. That's really a It's nice to know so much uh, action has been taken. If I could possibly ask just one final uh, question, and that is in the police is uh, what relationship with social landlords on anti-social behaviour. Um, I'm aware there's no partnership working on that. Is there any more information you can give on that? Are you quite satisfied that this new partnership working is results you would expect? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, answer that, Chair. I'm yeah. no, sorry. Hey. Apologies, Chair. I think uh, Chief Inspector Cameron is looking for some advice about answering uh, the question. I think it would be okay to answer it in general terms, but not to talk about any specific cases, if that's this. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so in terms of social landlords, then, so we, we have a partnership hub uh, in Inverclyde uh, and at the moment, and it's, it's, it's subject to review anyway, the partnership hub, because um, uh, we're looking to try and consolidate it a, a wee bit more than what we currently do. But at the moment, uh, on a Tuesday and a, and a Thursday, we have bespoke meetings with each of the uh, social landlords, and the larger social landlords in Inverclyde, uh, and to discuss incidents of antisocial behaviour or, or any other concerns that we've got relating to their housing stock or, or the individuals who occupy their premises. Um, so we have a brilliant relationship, actually, with the, the landlords doing that. Uh, and we have actually uh, been quite successful recently We're getting... Uh, people moved on from premises who are just not abiding by the the rules of their tenancy, um, and, and we're working with them on a number of issues at the moment in relation to people who are causing uh, concerns around about whether it be drug dealing or just antisocial behaviour. So, in terms of the, my relationship with them, I would say I've got an excellent relationship with them, and it is working. Okay, thanks, Jackson. Happy with that. Yeah. Councillor Dyson. Thanks, convener. How are we going this time? Fingers crossed. Uh, Chief Inspector, just a question around um, shoplifting. So you mentioned about the exclusion zones. Can you just give, give us a bit of a, a feedback on what the feelings are on how successful these exclusion zones have been elsewhere or what's the general feeling behind that? And um, with, with the uplift in the five-year average, are you finding any... Um, different types of people shoplifting now that there's a cost of living crisis? Uh, okay, so exclusion zones is something that I, uh, I've personally been pushing for in Inverclyde. Um, I've been area commander 
elsewhere in, in Scotland, and I've heard a number of other positions uh, where we've had exclusion zones in, in, in operation, and they 100% do work. They, they, give us the, they give us their power and their autonomy to deal with problematic shoplifters. We, I know I've reported this in the past. I, I don't have the up-to-date figures, because uh, I, I wasn't sure if you wanted that this time or not, but I think I reported there was 10 individuals for almost 250 to 300 shopliftings between them. Um, and, and, and what happens is, is they get arrested, they go to court, they get released, they get arrested, they go to court, and, and so the cycle just keeps going. Um, and they, they keep going into the premises and, and stealing stuff. Um, so the exclusion zone will allow uh, police officers in Inverclyde, where, where the sheriff, at the point of uh, releasing the individual on bail, will then say, I'm going to set an exclusion zone for you, and the exclusion zone will be... And we have, we've come up with two defined areas, it's predominantly Greenock or Port Glasgow. It could be both, because if, if I'm stealing stuff from both, it could be both. And, and we might set times where you're not allowed in any shop premises or in any of that vicinity between this time and that time, or it could be 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, and, and then basically what happens is, is if that individual is then seen by the police officer uh, in that area, in breach of that exclusion zone order, they are arrested and they go to court and it's, it's deemed as a breach of a, a uh, court order, uh, and then uh, we'll see what happens if they go to jail or not. Um, but so it gives us it gives us lots of powers to be able to deal with individuals who we know that are going to go and steal something in Inverclyde, um, and you know, two hundred fifty to three hundred uh, shopliftings between ten named individuals. Um, we need to do something about that. So exclusion zones really good. Um, and in terms of the uh, what was the second part of the question again? It was. It was just around, um, due, due to the cost of living crisis, I would imagine that there's going to be possibly certain um, different types of people, more unusual types of people who are guilty of shoplifting now or, or are attempting to do so. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, the traditional shoplifting is still, uh, that's still there, but we are seeing an increase in, in short, uh, food shoplifting uh, taking place as well. So I don't have the actual figures on that, but um, cost of living, you know, is... is is impacting on people really hard. Um, we have seen a number of electricity meters. Uh, I know it's not shoplifting, but it's just it's the same same situation with cost of living. Electricity meters getting bypassed, um, and we've run some um, safety awareness sessions around about that as well to the public and highlighting the dangers and the fire the fire risks in particular. And I know I, I know Mother was uh, agreeing with me there. Um, we've done stuff with the fire service around about that as well because. Bypassing the electricity meters uh, is certainly increased in the area, and we've reported quite a few people uh, for that as well because it is an offence. Um, so yeah, so it's difficult times. People are some of difficult measures. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Sir. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Superintendent O'Callaghan, did you want to come in, or was it just a reference to a solicitor? No, I was going to come in. It was in relation to one of the previous questions, in particular around um, domestic abuse. Um, I know Paul already referenced during his, his initial presentation um, the increase in detection rates in that field. Um, it was just to talk about one of our more recent introductions around public protection, as we've now introduced for the first time in Inverclyde, a public protection unit proactive. Um, and what, what that means is it's a team of officers that are dedicated to all public protection unit offences who um, on a daily basis are proactively tasked by Paul and his team um, to look at perpetrators of all, all types of uh, crimes in relation to public protection. So that they're solely dedicated to that and proactively look to introduce and, and develop what Paul's already referenced in terms of Murov. Um, so they're allowed that bit, extra bit of time to go and speak to potential previous victims. Um, and then through that linkage, we've been very successful in bringing individuals uh, or reporting individuals, not just for that offence committed in Inverclyde, but often offences that are committed elsewhere um, across Scotland as well to previous partners. So the proactive team, the results on that following the recent introduction um, have been very, very positive. So Paul will be able to give you a little bit more detail about that, I would suggest probably in terms of the next committee relative to their success. Thank you, sir. I would add to that is we've also got the dist, what we call the distance. It's a, if you if you suspect if you've got a, a new partner or and you suspect that they have been 
a perpetrator of previous domestic violence and you and you want to reassure yourself, uh, there is in Scotland uh, fantastic legislation that allows us it's right to ask, right to tell, um, to tell individuals so that if 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 you know if I don't know your daughter, your son enters into a relationship and you think it's you know that person's past history is domestic violence, you have the right to ask and we have the right to tell you um, if it's appropriate. Um, and then you can make a decision whether you stay in that relationship or not. And again, that's about trying to prevent uh, further victims of domestic violence. So that's that's fantastic legislation in, in Scotland. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Uh, you've been very patient. Councillor Quinn. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question for me. So I just, uh, I'd seen that there was an increase in the fire raising. So apologies. Uh, there was an increase in the fire raising crimes, uh, and I was just keen to explore the bit about the advice to the household and common places to remove combustible items. So I'm just seeing how how successful has that been? Is um, you know, and is there any powers or action that you can take to to enforce that? Maybe it's a question for our fire and rescue colleagues as well. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, it's a joint right. one. Okay, well, I, I, it's okay if I go first, model. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, Paul. Yeah, so this is something that I raised um, a wee while back. Um, uh, obviously, Inverclyde has seen and continues to see an increase in willful fire raising. So I'm looking at every opportunity in which uh, to try and design willful fire raising out. There's, there's opportunists uh, in Inverclyde who just set fire to things when the opportunity comes their way. Uh, we have came across a number of... Uh, uh, combustible item, items that have been found in common courses. They're either blocking fire exits or they're block, blocking the, the egress to, uh, for people who are living in the top floor to get out of the building. Um, and so we have have removed uh, some items from these common courses when we've came across them. Uh, I have linked in with Inverclyde Council. It's still work in progress with this uh, and the fire service were there as well. It's about um, getting the message out to the, 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 the tenants that it is actually illegal to leave your stuff in the common course, and it goes against your tenancy agreement. I've linked in with the housing providers as well, and they've they've also written to other tenancies to make sure that that's the case. Um, we do need to do a bit more work around about this because there is still a number of common courses that have these items in the in the course. Um, my worry is that if we don't remove this stuff, it's going to go on fire, and, and there may well be a fatality. We had a, a common course fire uh, not that long ago. Uh, where there was a child taken to hospital for smoke inhalation. Uh, I will say we were lucky on that occasion that nobody died. Um, so I think there is a, a lot more work that needs to be done uh, by all the partners when about rectifying this because it's still a very much a, an ongoing issue in Inverclyde that I am concerned about. Uh, Murdo, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Just uh, can confirm and reiterate everything that you're saying. The, the the fire service has no specific legislation that we can apply with regards to domestic premises uh, in this type of situation. However, we'll always provide advice and support, uh, and we will act as soon as we are told. Normally, we'll get intelligence through the uh, community uh, by our concerned neighbour that there's um, waste material in a in a common close, and it's a and it's and it's a potential fire hazard. Quite quite rightly, one of the one of the key issues that we have is that. Uh, it tends to be chargeable for these items to, to, to be removed. And that's a bit of a blocker for us in respect of being able to get this uh, removed safely and uh, swiftly. So perhaps that's something that collectively as a as a partnership we can look at to um, improve community safety. But it is a, a, an ongoing issue that we have a great concern about. Once again, to reiterate, there's no specific legislation available to us because it's domestic premises and doesn't come under the Fire Scotland Act as a result. Uh, however, we do have a really good partnership approach to this, but I think that the chargeable element of removing domestic waste causes us some 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 challenges there. Thank you. And that, and that charge, so it's twenty five pounds for five items to be removed, and that that has been a bit of a hurdle. Twenty five pounds um, oh, to a family in Inverclyde. Some families in Inverclyde is is a huge amount of money, um, and so it's to try and see if there's a way around about that. But we do need to look at it. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Ms. Bates, um, can I ask the your good offices to look into the £25 uplift if there's any way 
um, it could be negated if there was a fire risk in a close. Thank you. You could report back to the next meeting. Thank you. I see no more on chat and no more lights in the room. Oh, Councillor Cloherty. Yeah, I think just before we finish, it's just a comment um, on perhaps the biggest piece of operation we had in Clyde over many, many a year, and that was the Operation Tell, and I'll be, I'll be careful, and, um, and I know you can't kind of reach me to kick me under, but I will be careful. <laughs> it's really just to, to commend um, our police and fire departments uh, who worked in unison there. Um, I think if you, if you followed anything to do with the, the, the current proceedings, you will get the sense of the amount of work that was done between the two organisations, but especially the police force behind the scenes and the, the, the forensic examination of, of evidence that was given there. So it's just a, a wee thank you, because I know a lot happened um, within my own ward, I know in other wards as well, um, but it's just to say we, we do recognise and it's maybe a, a, a chance to just, again, thank your your members of staff and your detectives for the painstaking number of hours they must have put in in, in that case. So just a, again, a few thanks to myself and I'm sure from the committee as well. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Um, as, just before we move on, um, I had occasion to meet with uh, Sergeant uh, Derek Bradley, colleagues who's our uh, liaison officer I know other councils have met with them, and it's something I can recommend taking an hour out of your time to go and have a chat with uh, Sergeant Bradley um, because he's it's an excellent role that as our liaison officer, and he can direct direct any complaints we have to, to the right area. Yeah. But thank you so far, um, Chief Inspector. We'll now move on to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service report. Mr. Henderson or Mr. McGee? Thank you very much, Convener. I'll present the report today. Thank you. If I can refer, first of all, to page three in the report, which gives us our overall uh, statistics across the Inverclyde locality and the wards. Um, delighted to see overall uh, both a year-on-year -year change and a three-year average change with regards to, to statistics tend to be all green lights with a, with a reduction. Um, the the areas where we do have increases, which is unintentional injury and harm, non-domestic fire safety regards this year, and unwanted fire alarm signals. I'll talk a bit more about that when we go through the specific area of the report. But overall, uh, and again, one, once once again, because I tend to say this regularly at these meetings, is that our, our overall statistics are pleasingly on a downward trajectory. So if I move straight past incident summary on to page five, which is accidental dwelling fires. A reduction again this period. And uh, as per the police report, this is from April to the <coughs> end of June. So a downward trend is very, very welcome. Um, as always, and I know I repeat saying this, and I will not stop saying that. Well, I will because I'm retired next week. But as a fire and rescue service, we will always herald the impact that smoke detection, heat detection has on public safety. Uh, and in the majority of, of instances, that detects the, the incident in the first place, and the severity of the incident is very, very low. We always carry out post-domestic post response when we do get accidental dwelling fires, and that increases knowledge around about the locality uh, for the danger of fire within communities. That works incredibly well. And once again, I know I always herald and complement the partnership working we've got with the Inverclyde Hub, and that works incredibly well. If I can refer to the cost of living crisis we just spoke about, that's one area of concern for us uh, as we move into the winter, uh, and it will not be lost on any of us with regards to the, the increased cost of living, the increased cost of energy. And therefore, this is really just a, a plea to everybody who's taking care of our, of our community. We are here for advice and support. It's highly likely that people will be looking for alternative means, perhaps, to, to, to heat and light their, their homes, which gives the advent the potential of candles, that the you know, super-sear gas fire that's not been used for, for years comes back out for, for use. 
Uh, in addition to the matters that Chief Inspector Cameron spoke about with regards to bypass of meters, which all give the potential that we have an increase uh, in uh, fire hazard. Uh, and, and therefore, both an impassioned plea that we are here for advice and support. We carry out free home fire, fire safety visits to combat that. And from the end of October, we're also carrying out partnership training uh, for all areas of local authority and uh, third sector uh, to uh, highlight the potential hazards we could find in homes and provide education on that so that we can get referrals where people perhaps need advice and support if they are using alternate means to heat their homes and light their homes. Once again, moving on, in page six, we uh, have uh, no accidental injuries regarding related to dwelling fires this year. Very pleasing to report. Unintentional injury and harm is on an increase, but as I explain every every period with this, uh, it tends to be helping partner agencies, uh, and and that for me will will only increase, and rightly so. We have the capacity and we have the ability, we have the training, we have the skills to be able to assist partner agencies, particularly Scottish Ambulance Service. So I would expect that this data, these figures with, with regards to unintentional harm, will be on the increase as we uh, continue to to change the way we do our business in some ways. And I'll talk about our unwanted fire alarm signal strategy later on, which will uh, come into force next year in 2023. Uh, and that will give us more daytime capacity to potentially assist more with other agencies. The road traffic collision statistics that we have, once again, as uh, similar to Chief Inspector Cameron report, um, small numbers of incidents can tend to have uh, more than one person involved in each car, for example, which can give higher higher figures, but very, very pleasing to report that uh, injuries tend to be very, very slight. Certainly this report and period, and it tends to be people who have just gone to a hospital for a precautionary checkup. Moving on to deliberate fire setting on page eight of our report. Again, we have an, an overall reduction. However, there's no complacency there. As Chief Inspector Cameron highlighted in his report, there are areas of concern within our wards. And therefore, to reassure you, we are fully cited in this. We are working in partnership to uh, combat this and, and do work with it. However, elements that we spoke about with, with regards potentially lifting, lifting fuel. You can't have a fire without fuel. So if we could do something about taking away that, that hazard, uh, that would that would improve this situation. And I think as previously reported, Denver Clyde uh, officers are also on a Scottish National Task Group with regard to reducing deliberate fire setting uh, as, a, as a theme right across the, the, the country. Moving on to non-domestic fire safety, so private businesses, an overall reduction, and once again, I'll pay homage to our professional fire safety legislation officers who audit our non-domestic premises, provide advice and support to duty holders in order for them to meet their legislative obligations. So overall, a reduction here again, and pleasing, pleasing statistics overall, where we are seeing incidents, once again, there is, it is very, very slight damage caused to premises, which gives rise an indication that the detection and the systems that are in place within buildings are doing their job. Finally, in the, in the report, if I move on to unwanted fire alarm signals, we do have a year-on-year -year increase here, even though the three-year average is overall down, or just an increase of 1%. Um, there, there has been some... Uh, spikes during this reporting period, uh, which I wouldn't in individualise in a public meeting. However, what I can reassure you is that where we have had uh, individual buildings or individual duty holders, where there's been a sharp increase with our unwanted fire alarm signals, we have a UFAS unwanted fire alarm signal champion uh, within Inverclyde, uh, works closely with the duty holders, and we have what's called our Take 5 campaign, which is an education piece especially uh, relevant for the likes of hospitals, uh, just, just to remind staff of the the five key things that can end up uh, with us having uh, unwanted fire alarm signals. Um, as reported previously and was subject of the consultation, 
we're expecting in 2023 that we will fundamentally change the way that we respond to unwanted fire alarm signals. This will not reduce the safety of our community at all. However, it will reduce the amount of times when we have uh, fire appliances and firefighters responding to uh, alarm signals that we already know are false alarms. And I'm, I very, very much welcome that in respect of our ability to be a lot more innovative in how we support the community and protect the community in different ways by freeing up that capacity, which, as I usually uh, report, takes up 20 to 25 percent of our operational activity, particularly during the day. So that concludes the overall report and the areas it was scrutinised upon. I'll be more than delighted to take your questions. Thank you, Murdo, uh, and your, your last act in the, in the fire service. Um, do we have any questions for Murdo? Councillor Jackson. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, David. It's, um, I suppose it's a sad indictment in the times we're living in that we've got the police and fire services uh, commenting on uh, the cost of living crisis and the dangers it's causing out there. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not good. I, I do have a question, and it's about. Uh, and I'm not going to get specific here, but I'm going to mention it. I'm going to mention it. You're here, I'm going to see you. There's no way. It's just on the ground, Glenn. There's a lot of fire raising up there. Mr. Henderson, I believe it would be really difficult for the fire service to access and put these fires out, given how far around the plane is. What, what, what kind of uh, what, what kind of activity would take place in the fire service uh, if uh, when the fire when these fires are started in there? The the judge have all the area off would you make an attempt to get and put the fire out? So I understand it's a real difficult area to access, you know. We, we talk about victimless crimes and stuff like that, but you know, the, the guys have been putting a hell of a lot of work uh, uh, turning that place into a, a, you know, a, a natural place of beauty and it's getting you know for people to get in there start fires. It just sets them back, and it is, it's, to say, it's, um, it must have upgraded for them, but I know that she has to work in there just to have a second by that. So, uh, a question you ask is, how did you go about trying to um, stop that fire or uh, for access to the place? Well, though, I think that's a very good question for you. You can, it's half of society's problems there, and that, but over to you, Murdo. To answer the question uh, generically, first of all, we will always provide a, a response where there's where there's fire activity, and uh, uh, we, we will we will always deal with that, whether that be uh, extinguishing it, no matter where it is, we, sh we should be able to to get access to it. Um, more specifically, Colin, I'd just like to bring Colin as Inver Clyde officer in just to talk about some of the specific di dynamics around that location. Hi, sorry, you, you you were breaking up. Could you could you just repeat the specific location that you were referring to there? That was you were breaking up. Yes, you can. Yeah, Colin, it was uh, North Mount Glen. Um, we, we know there's been fire raising uh, quite yeah. deep into the Glen, uh, which is must be really a tough location for your officers to get in and deal with. Uh, I know Mr. Henderson has said that you all access and, and deal with the fire. Uh, it must be a lot of application to access. Uh, it was about the open plan. Right. Yeah, I'm with you. I've got you now. Yeah, I've got you now. Yeah, what we'll do, yeah, that's been highlighted as one of our areas of concern and it comes up at our partnership hub meetings as well. So we obviously are aware of it. Um, we've had crews um, in certain areas in Inverclyde doing daily and shift uh, drive bys of areas of high fire activity. Uh, that really sends uh, a strong community message that we are active in the community and we're aware of the possible access problems to different sites. Um, so just by our presence and our professional knowledge of the area, uh, we rely on our expertise and, and that's what we use to, to highlight these areas. Okay, thank you, Councillor Daisley. Thanks, Convener. Uh, yeah, it was actually a very similar question to Councillor Jackson's about a specific uh, a hard to access location and uh, behind Branchton in the Green Up Cart. Now, you you everybody will know this that every year that 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 gets set on fire and you know Touchwood 
this year. I don't believe we have had that repeated. So I just again want to know if that was a concerted effort or it's just coincidence or what's the thoughts behind that location? Sounds like Colin. Colin, you want to take that as a local commander for Inverclyde? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very similar answer. Again, it's one of our highlighted areas. Again, we're a partnership uh, working with uh, Police Scotland as well. We're, we're aware of activity in the areas. Uh, the reporting period, we've actually had um, a reasonably quiet uh, deliberate fire setting period in some of these areas. Um, so uh, we, 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 we do take a bit, a bit of credit for that. And again, it's a high presence of activity in the area. And if, if local youths or whatever see is in the area, then it does it does discourage. And that's that's an activity that we've put into our station working routines and the crews are out and about in, in, in the local areas of high activity. So I think that is uh, we're, pe we're seeing some uh, some good results out of that now, I would say. Okay, Councillor Daisley. Thank you, that's great. Cheers. Tell me, what, what did you do to improve your sound quality? Uh, I turned my video off. Uh, right, thank you. Thanks. Very good. Um, any other? Yes, Travis. Uh, Mr. Kino, uh, this is a matter which I, I hesitate to bring before this committee. Uh, it's quite sensitivities about it, but I think uh, it would be remiss of me as a, a local councillor if I was not to raise this in a, uh, a public forum. And this is concerning the ongoing situation at Duval Farm in Port Glasgow. And this will concern the police and uh, the fire service. But I've had uh, long discussions with officers within the, the council at this and uh, understand their frustrations with uh, regards to the ownership of this place, the sublettings that are regarding it, and their involvement with SEPA. And it seems... Apologies for interrupting, convener. Uh, I think uh, all members and uh, was answering are quite careful not to talk about specific cases and where we think that we are straying into a specific territory, then we have to be careful and just talk in general terms. Apologies. All right. Uh, in I what the what... Has been careful. I've not detected any hint of where the location is. Uh, the situation is we have a uh... Uh, an area, a farm, which is full of uh, tyres. And the ideal situation is to get rid of these tyres. They are uh, a danger. They are a time bomb uh, that will... Uh, there has been various attempts at fire raising uh, that have been extinguished in due course uh, in time. But the, there is a stock of 18,000 tyres stored within premises in Inverfight. And... SEPA are not moving in the fastest direction that they could, and the council officers seem to be very frustrated at the inaction here. But as local councillors, we have a duty to uh, our constituents to make sure that this is dealt with as quickly as possible. I would just ask the, the, the fire service representatives and the police representatives, uh, do they share our frustrations here? Who's taking that first, Chief Inspector? Well, I'm quite happy to start now, if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I can talk to this uh, generically because I've got yeah, significant yeah. experience of, of this and similar incidents when I when I worked in the civil contingencies reference within the, within the fire service, which is all our uh, emergency planning work. Now, over the years, yes, first of all, I agree you with, with your frustration. Some of the elements which are pertinent here is that, once again, as per the um, same but different to what we're talking about with fires and domestic closes, uh, uh, an example such as this does not come under the Fire Scotland Act as a relevant premise. Therefore, the legislation to be able to combat that quite rightly lies within environmental health or the Environment Agency. And we are all aware, because we're sitting here discussing this, how difficult that has been in respect of who to apply that legislation to and, and, the, and the time factor that it takes. Fundamentally, for the for the for the for the previous experience I have of where this has happened in the past, where you have significant storage uh, of of tyres, uh, it has fallen back on the local authority, uh, and in some cases with liaison with Scottish government 
to be able to get funding to, to deal with that because we're all aware there's a significant cost involved for the disposal and clear up of tyres. And, and our operational perspective, which I have to say I'm very comfortable with the partnership work that has gone on with Police Scotland and the rest of the partnership, uh, for us to have very robust operational response plans, the intelligence gathering that's happened with local crews, constantly being around these locations is as is, 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 is comfortable as I can get, I have to say. Uh, and, and the report that's been circulated with the potential uh, exclusion zones, if there was a fire there, is all very, very robust. Um, However, in the past, when they've been when they've been cleared, it has been a local authority that has led on this, uh, in my experience, and it's been linked into elements such as uh, the locality of it has been very near an, an, an industrial area, a railway line, or in one of the most recent examples, it's been right next to a hospital. Therefore, I feel that the imperative has been a lot higher there with regards to having to, to remove that, that, that potential hazard. We have the same thing here to be fair, because it is, it's right next to a housing development. Uh, but the clear up of it, I share, I share your frustrations. There's no legislation we can apply as a, as a fire service to assist with that, other than highlight the dangers to emergency responders and the public. Um, I'll hand over to Paul at that, thank you. Yeah, um, so I became aware of this because there was a fire uh, at that locus uh, by young people uh, who had set it on fire. Um, and then when I looked at it closer, I, I became really concerned, and I am still very concerned about that location for a fire. Uh, it's it's a disaster waiting to harm, in my eyes, to be honest with you. I asked the Civil Contingency Resilience Officer to chair a meeting with uh, a number of partners, CPA, Fire Service, Scottish Armland Service, Council uh, and Police. Um, I purposely asked for an independent chair uh, because obviously I've got a view on it and I didn't want to skew the outcome of any, any review. So they, they, they took that and, they, and the outcome of that was we came up with a MIR, basically it's a major incident response plan. Um, when, and I say when, not if, when it goes in fire at some point. Um, and actually when you read the report that comes from civil contingencies and actually the fire service, it's really, really alarming. The, the danger that that's going to cause to that local community in terms of the toxics, the toxins that's going to get released into the air. And we had an expert that came on and told us about what that would mean to the local community. Um, I have been asking, and I'll continue to ask, I don't, I, I'm not going to get into the argument about who's responsible for removing it. Um, I know it's a lot of money, um, but this is, this is something that we really do need to look at because it is, it'll get, it'll get, Somebody will set it in fire in the future. Uh, I asked for the building to get inspected because I, I felt it was unsafe. The fire service agreed. Uh, other partners didn't. I asked if I could get Harris fencing put round about it um, because it is an ownership dispute. We don't know who the owner of this. Uh, we suspect we know who it is, but we, we, at this stage we still don't. Um, and we have various warning signs put up to tell particularly young people to keep out because it's dangerous. Uh, the worry is that parts of that building are being held up by the tyres. If they get set in fire, that takes away the construction of the building. It's going to fall. If it falls on somebody, that's going to be horrendous. So I, similar to the common close situation, where everybody's hands seem to be tied, we are sitting here waiting for that to go on fire. There is a plan in place uh, about how we will approach that fire, how we will extinguish that fire. I really don't think we should wait till it goes in fire. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Uh, Ms. Banks, if you want to contribute from an officer point of view. Yes, and aware of the ongoing um, discussions around this, I suppose the uh, the prime objective of this committee is basically um, making sure that we do have a plan in place if, if, uh, if there was to be a fire, and I know there is comprehensive planning around that multi-agent. Um, multi-agency partnership work. It is a, it is a difficult issue, um, uh, looking which is responsible and also looking at what happens afterwards because even if ties are removed, there is a strong likelihood and the same um, things could just repeat itself as well. So it's actually um, one look at behaviours. You know, we don't want our young people to be going out and set, starting fires in the first place, either in a, a location like that or in, in, in any location, um, either rural or uh, close to any schools, you know, we do have to keep working with our young people to try and change those behaviours. 
I suppose for this for this committee particularly, um, you know, making sure that uh, the partners are working together, that the police and the fire and the council are working in partnership to make sure that we put them within what we are able to do and put in a comprehensive and robust plan in if anything happens. Thank you. Um, I, I went up to the look at it at the weekend. The, the farmer who did work at, uh, 30 years ago used to have the contract to clear the farm roads um, between Port Glasgow and Kilmacom. Uh, he's away to um, Canada. And we're yeah. this. Convener, apologies for interrupting, but we can't indeed find any Don't worry, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> We've been in Canada for 30 years. Um, but it's a sad, sad place. It really is. And I had a look around the buildings, and they don't look in great nick. Have we, as a building control, had a look at the buildings there? Do you know, Ruth? That, that would be something for another committee. I, could, I, can, uh, I can take advice from my friends, but uh, yes, um, from my colleagues. Wow. But you can be assured that uh, everything that can be done is being done by the Office of my colleagues. Provost. Thanks, Mr. Peter. Yes, I, I take note of the, the comments of the, the police service and the fire service and our officers. Uh, perhaps it's far too simplistic an answer to say just get these tires out as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That uh, was certainly worth raising, brothers. Um, if there's no more questions, I know. Shall we move on to agenda item number four? Local police and fire scrutiny panel update report. Mr. Stoart. Convener. Thank you very much, Kavina. Uh, this is just an update of the national uh, and local initiatives and reviews. It's been uh, discussed by police, the, the Scottish Police Board and the Fire Service Board. The final report gives you a number of uh, ongoing initiatives that the Police uh, Fire Board are discussion. 3.1 gives you the, the notes of the last uh, police, uh, sorry, Scottish uh, Police Association's meeting. Within that, there's a number of items being raised within the report. Uh, 3.6 gives you an update of an emergency inspectors uh, in their annual report within 3.7. Uh, 3.8 uh, within the report gives you an update of the, the recent uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Board meeting uh, and comments from that are underneath 3.9 and 3.10. Uh, 3.11 is an update from the, the request from the last meeting, uh, and maybe the area commander can come in, come in and discuss some of that. Uh, this is an update from the last Community Safety Partnership meeting and an update from the committee and requesting uh, an update of what uh, initiatives were happening in policing. Uh, within that report, uh, 3.14 gives a, an area commander's views on what's happening across Inverclyde uh, and uh, a robust report back to the Happy to take any questions, Kevin. Thank you, Hugh. Any questions? Councillor Cockerty, Councillor Jackson. Thank you, David. It's just on 3.3 resources spending review. Um, Ian Livingston, the head of the Scotland, has won the, I think they're looking at 66 million pounds worth of cuts. Uh, and he has admitted it is going to affect police numbers. Um, these cut of police numbers, you know, increasing on the cost of the crisis in the end, is going to make people more vulnerable than what they have previously. And I think these cuts to police funding is going to be serious and not going to affect. Um, I suppose this is maybe the, the formal task in the office here. I thought so on it. Um, but the Police Federation Scotland have, have made serious concerns. They issued serious warnings and concerns that these cuts are going to impact our communities. Now, when we look at all the crime, all the statistics we've just been through here, any cuts are going to have a serious impact on this community. So I'd really just like to get that out there. Thank you, please, for get for what they're doing uh, and hopefully they will get the, the money that they deserve because they're obviously not a, a, a priority 
uh, for the Scottish Government, but as we see through this report, they're not going to affect the their cuts. It's going to be a serious impact on the communities, uh, and I hope the Scottish Government uh, think twice about cutting uh, police funding. Thank you. Pat uh, Callahan, do you feel able to comment on what Councillor Jackson said? Um, yes, I, I can provide some comment and some overview. Um, you know, clearly, clearly the Chief Constable has outlined um, the challenges that policing face, um, not just in relation to the spending review budgetary cuts, but actually what that would mean um, on the ground in terms of officer numbers. Um, without a doubt, any reduction in police numbers in Inverclyde um, would have an impact on the, on the service that we deliver. Linked to that, um, we have some other um, well, well muted challenges that have played out in the media recently, and some of that reflects um, the change in legislation and regulation in, in relation to police pensions, um, which is seeing um, a number of officers retire um, earlier than previously would have been expected. Um, in the past, officers would work to 30 years, 30 years plus. Um, now officers have the opportunity to retire uh, with 25 years service if they've reached the age of 50. Um, and again, it's been well documented in the media um, the number of officers that um, are, are taking um, advantage of that change in regulation and are retiring earlier than expected. And with that, um, the loss of experience um, that we're, we're, we're currently facing um, as a police service. So the challenge is not just on the spending review and the potential reduction in police numbers. Uh, there are a number of challenges uh, that we're facing in policing. Um, how that manifests itself locally um, um, in terms of, yes, we have we have seen a, redu a small reduction in officer numbers uh, as a consequence of those pen pension changes. Um, we are getting other officers in um, to replace them, but that happens over a period of time. Um, and proportionally, um, I can assure you that Inverclyde are receiving um, a number of new recruits um, during the challenges we had that came with the tragic death of Her Majesty, for example. And five officers who are currently working or currently based at the Scottish Police College and um, going through their initial probationary training, um, we were able to secure their services, bring them out um, to Inverclyde and Remsture and actually had them working alongside their future colleagues. Um, so we are trying to be as agile as possible. Um, but in essence, it is a challenging environment uh, that we currently face relative to that reduction in experience, and will be an even more challenging environment as outlined by the Chief Constable um, relative to some of the, the budgetary cuts that we, we face as part of that proposed spending review. Thank you very much for that. I know you're, you're walking a tightrope in the answer to a question that, but thank you, appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's, it's very much along the similar lines to, to, to Colin, Councillor Jackson. I mean, obviously, I had asked about the police numbers, um, and I suppose in my earlier remarks uh, regarding Operation Trail, how, how great a job the local police did, both locally but also getting help in from other areas within Scotland in, in order to uh, to to support the local community in that very difficult time. I suppose my, my big issue is people's perception of crime is still very high, despite what stats tell us. And if we cut back numbers on the street, that perception of crime is only going to get worse. Um, I didn't expect that you would be able to get these numbers. I expected the reply that we were getting under a paragraph. Of course you're going to say you've got enough resources. Of course you're going to say that you can cover everything. I didn't expect anything else. But there is a genuine fear out there, um, especially on the board that the, the streets are set up, you know, that things aren't getting better, that things are actually getting worse. Um, and I suppose my plea is there's an old Scottish term about the green way gets fed first. And I suppose I want to be the first thing to say I'm green. So I'm going to ensure that we get resources in Greenock and in the claim uh, to ensure that we can have a, a safe community. Thank you, Councillor Cockerby. I don't know whether that requires an answer. I think it was uh, no, it a statement. Which, uh, I, I, it was a statement I asked you. I can confirm you'll get that level of police service. I can guarantee you. Thank you, Chief Inspector. That's very good of you. Now, uh, listen, I don't notice any questions on the chat. I notice no 
lights in the room. I'd like to thank uh, the police and fire and rescue representatives coming along today. I'd like to thank our officers for their contribution today. And thank you to 